speaker is Ken Wardle, who is going to talk about some of the work that arguably came came after his introduction to Malta and and uh, builds on exactly what David mentioned, which is this um, his relationship to research in the Aegean. Ladies and gentlemen, um, when I was first asked to contribute to this afternoon's sequence of short stories, I wondered what it was I would be able to say um, to add to other academic accounts of John's life and work. But as I thought about it more, I realized that as one of his PhD students, um, how much he had shaped my career and my future life after it. So to some extent, this is how what I experienced fits in with what I learned from John. It was when I was a first year student at Cambridge that I saw an advert posted on the wall. I think it was in the classics faculty, but let's not be too um, particular. Um, an advert for volunteer, uh, requesting volunteers for an excavation in Greece. There wasn't much detail except the name at the bottom was Colin Renfrew, um, of whom I knew nothing at that stage. I had some excavation experience in this country, and so I wrote in and said I'd love to join the project. And astonishingly, I was accepted. So the next stage was that the excavation team met up in London um, at John and Eve's flat in Swiss Cottage, and we met, I met John for the first time, I met some of the other members of the team, and we learnt more about what the excavation was going to be. But even that brief introduction bore no relation to the amazing experience for someone, I think I was 19 at the time, arriving in Greece, um, being told that we were going to be ferried by boat every day to this tiny island, Saliagos, Snail Island, um, I did wonder about copying the picture, and I realized it looks much smaller like this. Um, it's this kind of size you can swim around in the coffee break. Um, but Colin Renfrew had identified it as a likely place for late Neolithic settlement from the surface finds, um, the kind of settlement that had hardly been explored at that time. Um, how could you possibly have a settlement on an island this size? Well, the answer is, and actually I don't know which is the right answer, has the sea risen or has the land sunk? It used to be a promontory between the islands of Paros and Tiberos. And you just see Paros on the right-hand side poking out. Now, um, in order to get to this island, um, one had to travel by boat. And I seem to remember we set off before you introduced European summertime at some totally unearthly hour in the morning, like half past four, in order to start work at dawn. Um, the photography team, and I now understand why it was John who was doing all the photography on the site, uh, the photography team on occasion would come later in an even more intrepid fashion. And one of the things I learned about John in this process was that he was ready for almost everything. Um, he, he may not have been as handy, perhaps, as he might have been, and he may have been absent-minded, but when there was a task to be done, like taking photographs, he was in there and getting on with it. Um, the other thing I only learned later on was that John had been approached by the British School to conduct this excavation um, as the senior partner to a rather um, exuberant young PhD student, one Colin Renfrew. Um, and somehow, uh, I realized afterwards that John provided the, uh, the bottom, as it were, the serious um, control over what happened on the excavation, and Colin, of course, provided the enthusiasm. And together, they made a great success of it, from excavation through to publication. But, um, oh, by the way, I've enlarged John and his hat because very conveniently, I discovered going through my series of photographs earlier this morning, very conveniently he wore the same hat throughout the excavation. So I could spot him 
even at a distance, as it were. Um, on a tiny island, wind swept on a tall tower, taking photographs. They were all needed. Um, and indeed, uh, getting around the site could be a bit of a problem. I believe front left is Jane Ramsey, but um, I'm not absolutely so. And here, um, not only, of course, was he the photographer for the site at this stage, as one of the excavation director, directors, he had a great deal to do with the strategy of how exploration of this barely covered settlement was to be uh, carried on. And other part of his activity, again with Eve, studying the pottery that was recovered on the site, the pottery that was taken back by the Kaik every afternoon when work finished. They took us back as well, unless we wanted to swim, which was actually possible. I think it was only about a mile to the um, place we were staying. Um, the end result of this excavation was the discovery of a significant area of settlement, quite sophisticated construction, of the late Neolithic period in the islands of Greece in the Cyclades, where little had been known before this about the nature of life, um, and a pottery sequence which could begin to be slotted in to the pottery sequences um, observed in other parts of the Aegean. Um, the end result of the project, a major publication by John Collin in collaboration, um, here at the end of the day, the work was being taken back. I think we got on the boat as well. The workmen being taken back to Little Village on Antiparos, no electricity, no motor vehicles, uh, but there seemed to be a plentiful supply of food and red cena. No Rioja, as far as I remember, um, and ice. The big blocks of ice arrived on the morning Kaik from Paros every day and were shipped in. So there were some creature comforts, but an amazing experience all told. And one that encouraged me, from my knowledge of John, working with him, but when I reached the stage of applying for a PhD grant and a place to do a PhD, I naturally turned to John and the Institute of Archaeology in London, um, where I arrived in 1968, along with the first group of undergraduates to be admitted to the Institute. I'd already been able to do a certain amount of field study in Greece, collecting material in museums, so I was actually well ahead of the game as a PhD student at that stage. When I got to the Institute, I learned about John's involvement at Knossos, going back to 1958, when he was invited by the then director of the School of Athens, Sinclair Hood, to carry on the exploration of the Neolithic levels under the central court, and he carried out an important series of excavations at that stage. Um, results published uh, as they well should be. Um, here we see him characteristically studying the pottery, I think, in the uh, courtyard of Tavana at Knossos. But he resumed this excavation in 1969 as part of a much larger project sponsored by the British Academy investigating early agriculture and early human farming activity in the Mediterranean area. It had already been established that the um, earliest settlement of Knossos went back to something like 6 or was it 7,000 BC, depending how you read the Carpet 14 dates. Um, and it seemed an obvious site to continue the work, to extend the trenches, here seen in 1969 in the central court. I still quite, don't quite know how we managed to carry on an excavation surrounded by tourists who might fall in at any moment, um, to add to the complications of life. And he was able to reveal quite a large area of middle Neolithic structures. Um, and we got down to the lowest levels over those two years. Um, in the second year, I was invited to be assistant director on site for the excavation, and John would visit regularly. He would discuss, 
uh, what we should do. He would immediately grasp any difficulties of stratigraphy. Um, but he spent most of his time making sure that he understood the sequence of pottery, which was what was guiding us in terms of the explanation of where it was important to explore. Um, over here, Uh, where John was able, as we have just heard from David Trump, to revise his opinions and to come to new conclusions. And um, we had learned in the lectures that John gave us about early European Mediterranean prehistory that although there was an aceramic, pre ceramic stage to be observed in Anatolia, or in the Near East at Jericho, that there was no evidence for such a phase at, in Greece at all. Um, the early levels that he had found in the first series of excavations he regarded as a camp level, the first arrival of the settlers' site, who had not yet had time to make pottery. And the work of Theocaris in Thessaly uh, was regarded as perhaps not quite conclusive for the existence of such a phase. Um, sorry, in the wrong order. Apart from digging in the central court, which I'll come back to in a moment, um, we also were below the west court. The influence he must have had in order, in order to enable us to lift paving stones, uh, which never got put back properly, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> and revealed some rather important early Bronze Age buildings, a sort of bonus along the way. But in two of the trenches, um, we got down to levels, and we said, well, what's happened with pottery? We've only just gone below the Minoan, because we're down on the side of the mountain, which sits down here, which is terraced by the Minoans in the third and second millennium BC. And you go straight from Middle Minoan down into early Neolithic. And the excavator said, where are the animal bones? Where are the animal bones? Yes, we've got them. Where is the pottery? No, we haven't. And not only that, there were structures at this level. Not a camp, not temporary inhabitation, but to at least two phases, possibly three, of buildings made with mud brick, but no pottery. And we would discuss this with John, and in the end he said, well, I was wrong. There is. An aceramic Neolithic in Greece, and we found it. Um, I think he was slightly non by this, but nevertheless the excavation continued to be a major focal point, and recent work, um, Todd Whitelaw has been mentioned in some like 6 or what is 7,000 BC, depending how you read the Carbon 14 dates. Um, and it seemed an obvious site to continue the work, to extend the trenches, here seen in 1969 at the Central Court. I still quite, don't quite know how we managed to carry on an excavation surrounded by tourists who might fall in at any moment, um, just to add to the complications of life. And he was able to reveal quite a large area of middle Neolithic structures. Um, and we got down to the lowest levels over those two years. Um, in the second year, I was invited to be assistant director of the site for the excavation. And John would visit regularly. He would discuss uh, what we should do. He would immediately grasp any difficulties of stratigraphy. Um, but he spent most of his time making sure that he understood the sequence of pottery, which was what was guiding us in terms of the excavation of where it was important to explore. Um, over here... Um, where... John was... able, as we 
as we have just heard from David Trump, to revise his opinions and to come to new conclusions. Um, we had learned in the lectures that John gave us about early European Mediterranean prehistory, that although there was an aceramic, pre-ceramic stage to be observed in Anatolia, or in the Near East at Jericho, that there was no evidence for such a phase at, in Greece at all. Um, the early levels that he had found in the first series of excavations, he regarded as a camp level, the first arrival of the settlers site, who had not yet had time to make pottery. And the work of Theocaris in Thessaly uh, was regarded as perhaps not quite conclusive for the existence of such a phase. Um, sorry, using the wrong order. Apart from digging in the central court, I'll come back to in a moment, um, we also work below the west court. The influence he must have had in order, in order to enable us to lift the paving stones, uh, which never got put back properly, but don't tell anyone, <laughs> and revealed some rather important early Bronze Age buildings, the sort of bonus along the way. But in two of the trenches, um, we got down to levels and we said, well, what's happened to the pottery? We've only just gone below the Minoan because we're down on the side of the mountain. This is which was terraced by the Minoans in the 3rd and 2nd millennium BC. And you go straight from middle Minoan down into early Neolithic. And the excavator said, where are the animal bones? Where are the animal bones, yes, we've got them. Where is the pottery? No, we haven't. And, not only that, there were structures of this place. Not a camp, not temporary inhabitation, but to at least two phases, possibly three, of buildings made with mud brick, but no pottery. And we would discuss this with John, and in the end he said, well, I was wrong. There is an aceramic Neolithic in Greece, and we found it. Um, I think he was slightly non by this, but nevertheless, the excavation continued to be a major focal point, and recent work, um, Todd Whitelaw has been mentioned with somebody picking up the archive, and other people are going to uh, pick up where John had to leave off and complete this study in parallel with some new work and I was amused to read that they put in a new trench in the central court, and the result of putting this new shaft down was, yes, John Evans was right. And I wondered, well, why did they need to do the trench to prove it? But that's the way life is. Um, he always encouraged us, on site and off, to use our independence, to use our judgment. Though not always, he may not always have been uh, entirely um, happy with the results. I mentioned the visitors. There was one year when, although we had a fence around the area in the West Port, the visitors kept coming in, standing on the edge and kicking stones down and looking as though they would fall in too. And one of the team had the bright idea of doing one of those nuclear um, hazard warning signs, putting it up at the gate and saying, big label underneath, danger, radiocarbon dating. <laughs> I'm glad to say it kept most visitors out. Not <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon, but it kept most visitors out. Kathleen Kenyon came right to the edge and imperiously asked us what we thought we were doing. Uh, and until we recognised who she was, this became this is slightly um, surprising. Um, a major piece of research in Aegean prehistory, but my own story alongside this as a PhD student, I disappeared off to Greece for months on end. I collected material. I went back to see John and discussed it with him, got encouragement, a certain amount of good advice, but certainly no summon to see him every month as I am required to do with my PhD students at the moment just to make sure everything is going well. An entirely different kind of story. Um, it came to my PhD viva. And I don't really think I'd take much notice of who was going to examine it. And I was slightly surprised to find that John was my internal examiner. 
that wouldn't happen today either. But um, he took my work apart without fear or favour. He told me what needed to be done. And at the end of the day, yes, it had passed. Um, but John never gave me, as a postgraduate, or indeed any of the other postgraduates I knew, the impression that we were stupid or foolish. His diffident manner encouraged us to say what we thought, to try things out and do them for ourselves. And to me, that is perhaps one of the enduring things that I learned from John. Um, the guidance he gave me, the interest he showed, the assistance he gave me in my career afterwards in writing references. When I came to want to run my own excavation, I needed funding. I don't know what he ever wrote about it, but I got the money. So presumably it was the right sort of thing, and I got a job. And from then on, um, it carried on, I imagine, as much as he would hope that his students carried on independently, but reporting back at him, as I found myself doing over the years. And I am extremely grateful for the guidance and the opportunities we gave.